and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this FLT Connect event. Um, we are really excited to have Joa Lampman here um, to talk about ticks in New York and how to prevent tick bites and tick-borne illnesses. Um, so this event is being recorded um, and it will be available on our YouTube station. We'll send out a link um, after the event and on our website, we have links to all of our previous FLT Connects event, uh, Connect events. Um, I'm gonna send you a link to that right now, put that in the chat. Um, we have a, a bunch of great upcoming events coming up um, through, we've got it pretty much scheduled through April, but we're still working on getting some more in through the summer months and into the fall, and then again through the winter. Um, but we also have uh, all of the old FLT Connect events that we've offered. We've got links to those on our website so you can visit and see any that you might have missed. And I'm putting the link in the chat right now. Um, so before we get started, I want to introduce myself and tell you a little bit more about the Finger Lakes Trail Conference and some of our programs and events. My name is Christy Post, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications with the FLTC. Uh, the FLTC was founded in 1962, so we are celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. We'll be celebrating at a number of event events, um, including our County Hike Series, which will be through Tompkins County this year, our Trails Day celebration on Saturday, June 3rd at Steuben Brewing Company in Hammondsport, and our Fall Weekend event the weekend of September 16th to 17th in Ithaca. Somebody just say my name. No. Okay. Um, so check those events out and please join us. They're all on our website. Um, we're going to be adding information soon to our website about some other free uh, FLT hiking events this summer. Um, we have a hiking 101 program that we've offered for a number of years. We're launching a new Explore the FLT series this year. Um, we've got a hike and happy hour series that we offer with Steuben Brewing Company, and we're hoping to launch a similar event in Western New York. Um, and we're going to be uh, promoting and, and supporting some notable hikes on the North Country Trail, um, which the FLT hosts for about 430 miles through New York. So take a look at our website soon for all of those. Yeah. Can, can everybody please mute yourselves if you're not muted? Uh, and we're also going to be launching very soon our 2022 hiking challenge, which is the FLT 60 this year. Usually it's FLT 50, uh, but we're upping the ante for our 60th anniversary year. So the challenge is free and it's easy. You sign up online, hike 60 miles on the FLT before the end of the year, submit your miles online, and you earn yourself a certificate, a sticker, and a patch. And we'll have some fun promotions and raffles and things throughout the year. So please get signed up for that. It's a great way to just motivate yourself and friends and family and it's fun family activity um, to get out on the trail this summer. Finally, I wanna thank any members and donors that are here with us tonight. The Finger Lakes Trail Conference is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, the organization and the trail itself was built entirely by volunteers and the trail continues to be maintained almost entirely by volunteers to this day. Um, we have a few full-time paid staff people uh, I'm one of them. Our, the other is Michaela Aini, who is our Director of Trails Development. We have a part-time executive director. We've got some part-time office staff. Um, we do have some positions open. So if you're looking for employment and perhaps want to join the Finger Lakes Trail team, uh, please check out our website for information about that. We are hiring right now for an office manager. Um, <clears throat> but we are funded almost entirely through uh, membership dues and donations. So dues and donations are really important to us. And we want to thank anybody here who, who is a, a member and who's a, uh, made donations. And if you're not, please consider becoming a member. Um, you can do that on our website and I'll share a link in the chat soon here. Um, and you, or you could just make a donation and thank you. And please find us on Facebook and on uh, Instagram. And if you want to search for, there's a private Facebook group called Finger Lakes Trail Hikers and Friends, which is more of a, our, our Facebook page kind of pushes out information, but the Facebook group is an opportunity for uh, people to chat with each other. It's a great way to meet some other hiking friends, get tips about where to go um, and find people to hike. So, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joelle for Don't Get Ticked. Uh, Joelle is a community IPM extension support specialist. It's a very long title. Um, with the New York State IPM program at New Cornell University. She's got a degree in natural resources from Cornell, and she's a lifelong environmental educator. 
Um, at the New York State IPM program, Joel utilizes the clear knowledge-based decision-making process of IPM to tech ecology or teach ecology and make a difference one property at a time. Um, Joel and Joel is known as the Tick Lady. She's proud of this. We are we, we really enjoy that. Um, and, and, and we've offered this presentation before. We offered it last year and it was great. I, I am really excited to be sitting through it again though because there's a lot of information. I don't know. Um, I don't know. And I would try to remember when I was out on the trail and tell people and I knew I was getting it wrong. So I'm really excited to sit through this again tonight and hope you all enjoy. Uh, Joelle, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Christy. I'm really happy to be here. And as this storm is descending upon us, it might seem like a really odd time to be talking about ticks, but there is never a bad time to be bringing up this subject. We're going to get into the depths about that. Um, so this very first slide is showing a tick removal kit, and this is something that we are offering to everybody that is willing to complete a survey for us. So it's very simple. It, it's just asking for your first name. We are asking for your email address because uh, we are going to be doing a follow-up survey uh, to find out how this, this presentation and, and the Don't Get Ticked in your campaign uh, is impacting you and what you can do when you're out there. And within this kit, um, there's going to be a tick identification card because there are different tick species out there. There are the pointy tweezers, which is going to be vitally important to keep you healthy in case you do get a tick that is attached a magnifying lens because ticks are just really freakishly small uh, and a mirror uh, because they also like to hide in, in dark places that are always hard, uh, easy to see. So um, the URL for that survey is in the chat box. So you can go ahead and click on that. When you complete it, you're going to be sent an email thanking you for participating. If you want to get a kit, you can send that survey to Christy's email, which she put into the chat box, uh, along with your mailing address, and she will make sure that you get one of those kits. All right, moving on. So, any minute, now. there it goes. So just really briefly, we have, um, I work with the New York State Integrated Pest Management, which is a program out of Cornell. And we help people to deal with pest issues of all types um, from things that are in your house. We have a huge agriculture program. So um, basically we're looking for information that's going to help people to deal with their pest issues in an affordable, healthy way. So we were, um, given resources from the New York State Tenant Senate Force on Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases back in 2017. And with that, we built the Don't Get Ticked New York campaign, which included the funding that we needed to put together those tick removal kits. So we're trying to make it so that you just don't get tick-borne uh, diseases that are out there and, and really try to make it in, in a simple way. Um, how to, how to make this work within your everyday life. So we're going to be talking about this evening. We're going to be talking about piss, ticks. We're going to be talking about the risks that they provide to our health and to our companion animals. And then we're going to talk about ways that we can reduce those risks. But it really comes down to is that we want to prevent tick bites in the first place. Because um, when a tick bites you, that's when the problems can, can really start. So we'll start with basic biology. I want you guys to get involved. So get ready to get uh, put things in that chat box. Um, one of these is a tick, one of these is not a tick. Which one is a tick? The one on the left or the one on the right? There we, yep, there, okay, people know that it's on the left. What makes you think that that one is a tick? Eight legs, seen lots. <laughs> so yes, ticks are arachnids. They're, they're related to spiders and other types of mites. So that is certainly a way that we can tell that they are um, an arachnid. They also have two body parts. They have this really big um, abdomen, which we like to think of as a balloon filled with germs. 
And then it's got this small head with these ridiculously large mouth parts for the size of, of the rest of, of this uh, critter. The one on the right is a bed bug. Both of these things live exclusively on blood, but they have very, very different life stages. So the bed bug, which is an insect, and we know it's an insect because it has six legs and three body parts, they will um, spend most of their day hiding. And then when they have a body at rest near them, they're going to scutter out of their hiding place. They're going to insert their mouth parts and they're going to suck up the blood through that. And they're going to feed for just a few minutes and then they're going to scurry back and they're going to hide. And they just keep doing that over and over again. Whereas the ticks, they're going to attach and they're going to stay attached until they're done feeding, which makes it much, much easier for the germs that have figured out that ticks are the really they want to, you know, grab onto because they help them to be transferred from animal to animal. They do really well in the body. Um, they get transferred uh, really easily. So the germs and the ticks have really co-evolved uh, to work together. And fresh off the press's research, I know that ticks that are infected with the um, bacteria that causes Lyme disease allows the tick to survive cold weather better than ticks that don't have the bacteria. So they, they really are helping each other to our detriment. Um, I'm just throwing up this little extra picture. This is uh, the tick larva. Uh, this is what comes out of the egg. And you, if you can count those legs, there's only six of them. So if you're, you've got a microscope and you love looking at things underneath uh, microscopes and taking close looks at them, if you have a tick that is brand new, first life stage, it's only gonna have six legs as opposed to eight. This is not gonna be relevant to most people because they're really, really tiny. All right, so in New York, um, there are four ticks that we're really concerned about um, with a fifth one that, that we actually discovered uh, is now here in, in 2021. And so no, I actually didn't get it up on this slide. Um, so we've got the American dog tick. This is the tick that if you're of a certain age like I am, this is what we grew up with. They're big. They really like to attach along the hairline. When they're fully engorged, they're about the size of a grape. Um, they're pretty much throughout New York. This is the one we grew up with and a lot of the things that we think we know about ticks are relevant to the American dog tick. The Lone Star tick is a new and up and coming tick. It is firmly established on Long Island. It is moving up the Hudson Valley and there is also a population of them within um, the Rochester area. In other parts of uh, New York State, we don't, we will find them, but most of them are being dropped off on migratory birds and we're not seeing populations of them yet. But this is a tick that we need to keep in mind that we might run into uh, at any time. The black legged tick is the one we're gonna spend most of our time with this evening. Um, they are now spread throughout all of New York State. Uh, they carry the most diseases. Uh, they're the ones that we consider to be the greatest health threat. And then the Asian longhorn tick is a very new introduction. They were discovered in New York in, in 2019. Uh, they are an invasive species. And this one has this nifty little trait that uh, the females can clone herself. So she can lay 2000 eggs um, that could become viable and, you know, get their blood meals and, lay their own 2000 eggs. So once these become established, their populations can grow incredibly quickly because all it takes is one. So this is one we're watching really closely. And the new tick that we discovered last year is um, called the Gulf Coast tick. And it looks very much like uh, a dog tick only with longer mouth parts. Right now, it's only um, been found on Staten Island. So we're not gonna worry about it too much in the Finger Lakes region yet, um, but if you go and travel down there, it's something you should be aware of. So what else do we need to know about ticks? Well, one is that they are incredibly small. So this is the black-legged tick that is on uh, somebody's finger. 
And from left to right, we have that six-legged larva. It's so small, it almost fits in the groove of a fingerprint. Um, the next life stage uh, to the right of that is the eight-legged nymph stage. For scale, that's the size of a poppy seed. And then the two on the right, we have uh, the completely dark one is the male and the larger one that has the red, half reddish body is the female. And that's about the size of an apple seed. So they do get larger as, as they go on with their life stage, but for the most part, they are incredibly small. They are also what we consider to be blood feeding ectoparasites. So what does that mean? That means that there are parasites that are gonna feed on other things. Ecto means that they stay on the outside of the body. So there are myths out there that the ticks are gonna burrow in and get underneath the skin. They don't do that. They will insert their mouth parts but the rest of them is going to stay on the outside. What they are, it's incredibly sneaky. These are masters of stealth. So they're small and um, they have incredibly tiny feet and they walk on their toes. So the likelihood of you feeling one crawling on you is low. Uh, you might get lucky, one might trip over a hair and you kind of twang a nerve or something, but for the most part, you're not going to feel one crawling on you. So you can't count on that as a way to protect yourself. Those legs are made for crawling. So they're not jumping, they're not flying, they're not taking their energy and walking to the trunk of a tree and climbing up the trunk and then walking out on a branch um, to wait for somebody to drop underneath so that they can drop on you. They don't have the senses to do that. What they do is they do what we call questing. So this is the way they hunt. They're ambush hunters. They're going to crawl to the top of vegetation. And typically this is going to be uh, maybe a foot and a half above the ground at the most. Uh, it'll usually be even lower. And they're just going to sit on there and they're going to wait. And it's actually this part of that front legs that has the senses that lets them know that something warm, that's breathing carbon dioxide, that kind of has a feet smell to it is on its way and they want to get ready to latch on and then they're going to climb up the body until they reach a warm, dark, moist place um, on the body where they're going to then insert their mouth parts and they're going to feed for up to a week, depending on the life stage. So the good news is they're not jumping or flying or dropping down off of us, but the bad news is they are really sneaky and we usually don't know that they got onto us and then climbed up. I do wanna mention that Lone Star ticks are a little bit more aggressive. They tend to follow the trail of carbon dioxide. So when my coworkers and I are actually, we know we want to collect Lone Star ticks, we typically, aim for uh, roadside edges because they'll be attracted to the carbon dioxide that's coming out of the car exhaust pipes. Uh, so, so lying out, sunbathing where there are lone star ticks, they will um, crawl at a relatively fast pace and, and come and find you. So um, if you're in the Rochester area, there's lots of reasons not to sunbathe. This is a really good one too. They're, they're just more active hunters. Ticks are seasonal. So, you know, we all grew up with the American dog ticks. So we learned that ticks are a summer issue. But when it comes to the black legged ticks, they have a different life stage. So in the springtime, the female that has been hanging out all winter time is going to lay her eggs. And the eggs are going to sit there all spring and through a good portion of the summer. And then usually end of July, sometime in August, they're going to hatch out into that six-legged larva that fits in the groove of the fingerprint. Then it's gonna be searching for something to feed on. And typically that might be a, um, a rodent, a chipmunk, a mouse, usually something small because they're really small and they're not definitely not climbing up one and a half feet uh, looking for something to feed on. And after they feed, they're gonna drop down and they're gonna wait. They're gonna wait the rest of the summer, all of fall, all of winter, and in the springtime, they're going to emerge as that poppy seed size nymph. That nymph then is going to be looking for something to feed on. Again, usually that's going to be something small, 
just because of their, their size and, and how much they're going to travel. Uh, they're going to feed, they're going to wait the rest of the spring, all of summer, a good portion of fall. And then at about the time that the deer go into their rut is when the, the adults are going to come out. Now they want to feed on something larger because now they're looking to feed and the female wants to take a really good blood meal because she needs the energy to create all those thousands of eggs uh, and to get her through the winter time so that she could lay them in the springtime. So a tick, by the time that it reaches um, the adult stage and is ready to lay eggs, has fed all of three times. So they can go months without feeding. All right. Now, when, so now we think about the diseases that they carry, and these start off with in the animals that they're going to feed on population. So that larva, when it feeds for the first time, it's going to be feeding on something. In our area, mice, typically 90, 95% of them are carrying the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So the tick is going, if it's feeding, it's going to take the bacteria in with the blood and it's going to hold it in and it's going to still have that um, bacteria in its gut when it goes to feed as a nymph. It's going to feed. If the animal that it's feeding on didn't have a disease, it is now because the tick's going to give it to them when they're feeding on it. If the first animal didn't have any of these diseases, um, now that the tick has fed the second time, it has a second opportunity to pick it up. So in general, adults are twice as likely to be carrying a tick-borne pathogen than the nymphs are, but we consider the nymph to be the most dangerous life stage because of its poppy seed size. So most people don't know that they were bit by a tick um, because they weren't able to find this really small critter on them. That's what the books say. When we look at what actually happens out there, it's a very messy story. So this is gonna be very dependent on what the weather is. So we just went through a below average um, temperature January, but they're projecting that it's going to be a warmer than usual February. So all of the adult ticks that weren't able to find something to feed on over during the fall, if it's above 37 degrees, they will be out there and they will be looking to feed because they're really driven to feed and to be able to lay the eggs so that they can reproduce in the springtime. So they're out there and now we know that if they are curing the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, they're actually more likely to be able to survive the, the colder weather, the drier weather, and it actually gives them a little boost of energy so they're able to um, travel farther than they might if they were didn't have the pathogen in them. So they're even more dangerous than we, we knew a short time ago. And those adult ticks can last, I've, I have found them into the summertime um, before they finally run out of energy and, and die uh, because they don't have any more gas to go on. So we can run into the adult ticks that are twice as likely to be carrying the disease anytime from end of September up until July. Um, the nymphs are going to be very active. Uh, depending on temperature. Sometimes they become very active in April if we have a good early strong spring start, uh, but other times there was a few years ago where there was an incredible drought. The nymphs did not become active until it started to rain in July. So they're just waiting. They're just waiting until conditions are right and then they can start looking for their blood meal. So there really is no time that we are completely safe from ticks here in New York. So that's the, the black-legged tick is up on top and I've kind of shown you um, their life cycle. Dog ticks are typically going to be more of, of a summer issue. And for people, we only see the adults that are gonna feed on us. So we don't see the other life stages. For the Lone Star ticks, again, they tend to be more of a summer issue. 
And we're still working out the Asian longhorn tick uh, life cycle, but it also looks like it's going to be more of a, um, of a summer issue as well. And here we are. So February, we get past this storm, things start to melt down. We get a nice 50 degree day. We're all going to be outside. Well, the ticks are going to be out there questing as well. All right. What else do we know? Tick feed hosts. And not all hosts are created equal. Um, some they're going to prefer. Female ticks that feed on deer are going to lay more than females that feed on um, other types of animals. They just get the nutrients that they need uh, from deer. Um, possums have a reputation for being out there feeding up all the ticks. Um, the research that was based on was done in a lab. And pretty much if you put a possum in a cage and it has nothing else to do, it will groom every tick off of it. We don't see that so much when we look at uh, possums that are in the wild. And I also put a picture of a guinea hen on here because you will be told that if you want to get rid of ticks in your yards, you got to get um, guinea hens or chickens. And they do eat ticks, but they also get ticks. The research that showed that hens are really good at um, reducing tick populations was actually done in Africa. And that species of tick fed 100% on cattle. So when they put the chickens in with the cattle, they ate all the ticks and it really helped. But our ticks are just as likely to feed on the chickens as they are to be eaten by the chickens. So we don't see that as a way to, to protect yourself. So if you wanna get hens, by all means, get them, but don't get them for the sole purpose of trying to be, um, reduce your risk of ticks because it's just not going to work. White-footed mice are one of their favorite hosts for the larva and for the nymphs. And as I had mentioned, over 90% of them can be infected with the Lyme disease pathogen. And about 50% of them are infected with the pathogen that causes Lyme plus other uh, tick-borne diseases. So white-footed mice like to be where people are. Um, they do really well in our simplified neighborhoods where we've gotten rid of a lot of their competitors and we've gotten a lot rid of a lot of the things that feed on them. So mice thrive where we are and the ticks thrive where the mice are. And then there's the white-tailed deer. I already mentioned um, that females that feed on tick blood or on deer blood are more likely to be um, successful in laying more eggs. And you can see all of those ticks that are engorged on that uh, deer's ear. If you start doing the multiplication, uh, a single deer can be responsible for half a million. I have seen numbers up to one and a half million ticks per year. So they definitely have a role uh, in, in the tick life cycle. They also have very large territories. So deer are responsible for the long-term dispersal of ticks. Uh, we kind of like to think of deer as the cruise ships for the ticks. There's an all-you-can-eat buffet, they get to go to exotic places, and there's ample opportunities for them to find a mate um, so that they can get fertilized and the females uh, can, can lay fertilized eggs. They don't have a role in Lyme disease itself. Even if every single one of those ticks was carrying the pathogen that causes Lyme, um, it is not going to build up in that deer's blood system to the point that a tick biting it is going to be able to get the pathogen from the deer itself. So they are what we consider to be a dead end host. Um, as are people, it really snot knocks the snot out of us if we get Lyme disease, but the bacteria doesn't build up enough in our systems that if a tick was to feed on us and we had an active case of Lyme, that it would get enough bacteria so that they could pass it on to something else. All right, what else? Ticks have preferred habitats. So we were all told growing up, stay out of the tall grass areas, which is good advice for the, for the dog tick. For the black-legged tick, they needed to be very humid, about 85% or higher. So we're not gonna find them in dry, tall grass areas. We're gonna find them in woods, 
along the edges of woods. Uh, we might find them in taller uh, grassy areas if it's marshy because it has that humidity there. But otherwise, if it's a really sunny area, we're not going to see the black-legged ticks, but we very well might see the American dog ticks. The Lone Star ticks and the Asian Longhorn ticks um, are even less susceptible to dehydration. So uh, we're going to find those in, in drier areas. So again, there's really no place that's out there other than pavement uh, that were really completely safe from ticks. And there are some things that can make it worse. So as a trail group here, there is concerns about invasive plants. There is a direct connection to invasive species, including barberry, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, that can concentrate tick population, concentrate mice populations because most of those are prickly bushes so that offers protection for the mice and has lots of um, food in terms of berries for them. So we have a high po population of mice, a high population of ticks because those are humid areas. So we're going to have a higher population of ticks that are carrying the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of the number of ticks that are carrying the pathogen for Lyme that we might find in a barberry infested forest compared to an unin uninfested forest. So going out and trying to get rid of invasive species is not only great for native plants and all of the animals that de depend on them, but it is also going to help to protect against uh, these different tick-borne diseases. All right, what else do we need to know? Ticks are committed. Um, once they attach, they're going to stay attached for up to seven days. And during that time, they're just filling themselves with blood and they're just getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger as, as they're feeding. Um, the blood is made of different components and it, the water component takes up a lot of space. So they wanna get rid of that. So as they're feeding, they're also gonna be spitting stuff back into you. And that's what makes that process of the bacteria getting transmitted into us so easy uh, and, and why the bacteria has, has co-evolved with ticks. And they're very committed up to a point. So I, I love showing this picture of a microscopic view of the tick's mouth part. It looks something from like a horror movie. We've got um, the, the straw-like mouth part with the backward barbs in it. So once it gets that pushed into the body, it's kind of locked in there, but only to a point. So you can see here on the right-hand side, that's a mouse skin uh, for the sake of this picture, only the mouth part gets inserted into the body. The head does not go in, it's just the mouth part. So when we start talking about how to remove ticks, we hear a lot about, oh, you can't leave the head behind and this method is guaranteed not to leave the head behind. Here's the great news, you can't leave the head behind because it never gets inserted into the body. If the mouth parts break off, then it is no more dangerous than a splinter. So you don't need to be running to urgent care to have the mouth part surgically removed. You would treat it the way you would any other splinter. So along with the barbed mouth parts, there's also the saliva that gets involved. So in the saliva are antihistamines so that you don't have an allergic reaction because it wants to be there for a week. So it doesn't want you to start scratching around. Uh, there's painkillers, there is um, anticoagulants because it wants the blood to keep on flowing. There's a cementing agent that actually spits in to further lock it in. There's actually a thousand different proteins and other chemicals in tick saliva, most of which we don't know what it does um, that, that gets inserted. So those things alone can cause us a lot of angst. And with that, that saliva also comes the pathogens uh, that we don't want to have in our bodies. So this chart uh, is showing the different disease pathogens that are associated with the different ticks that I've mentioned today. So the black-legged tick can be transmitting Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Powassan virus, Borrelia miomonoi, and ehrlichiosis. 
where the American dog tick right now is only associated with tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, both of which are very rare in New York. The Lone Star tick um, is associated with ehrlichiosis, starry, uh, canine ehrlichiosis, tularemia, and maybe um, a form of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The research isn't clear on that. The Asian longhorn tick right now um, is, we know that it is transmitting a cattle-borne disease, so that's not affecting people. And it has been shown to transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the lab. We don't know yet whether um, it, it's actually doing that out in the wild. The research is continuing. And not only do we have these different pathogens, but we also have some things that happen as a result of some of the chemicals that are within um, the tick saliva. So there is uh, something called tick paralysis, mostly associated with adult female dog ticks. It's a paralysis that starts at the toes and works its way up the body. And if it's not checked, it can actually shut down the respiratory system. So it can be a, a fatal uh, effect. The great thing about this is that if somebody recognizes it for what it is and they find the tick and they remove it, the symptoms start to reverse immediately. So just being aware that there is such a thing as tick paralysis can help you to possibly save somebody's life in the future. Um, one of the things that I find to be really useful uh, with Lone Star ticks, or um, yes, with Lone Star ticks, is that they have something in their saliva called alpha-gal, which is a carbohydrate that is found in every mammal except for primates. And um, when they are feeding, they inject this alpha-gal allergy in. And if you are susceptible, not everybody does this, but if you are susceptible, you can become allergic to that alpha-gal carbohydrate, which means that the next time that you eat a meal with red meat in it, you can have an allergic reaction. And just like with bee stings, every time you, you are introduced to that allergen, the reaction is going to get worse and worse, um, leading up to anaphylactic shock and even death. So I find this incredibly useful, especially when talking to young men that are just like, oh, Lyme disease, I'll just go on to antibiotics and I'll be fine. But if they learn that they might never be able to eat a cheeseburger again, that gets their attention. So um, Lone Star ticks are in the Rochester area. They're downstate. They're spreading. Um, it's something to be really, really good uh, to be aware of. I just looked at the uh, chat and someone said they're moving to Greenland. There are ticks in Greenland, sorry to say, and then the ticks in Greenland are also uh, able to transmit Lyme disease. So Antarctica, you have to go to Antarctica to get away from ticks. And it's getting worse. So uh, these are maps from um, the Center for Disease Control uh, comparing 2001, where you can see the concentration of cases of Lyme disease were really downstate New York uh, and along the coast compared to 2018, where those cases are pretty much dispersed throughout all of New York itself. So there's no place that is, that is safe from them uh, now in the Northeast. And as I mentioned with the previous slides, um, it's not just Lyme disease. So there's anaplasmosis, babesiosis, tularemia, ehrlichiosis, and uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And I have the ticks above, uh, the ticks that are associated with those particular diseases. So I live in the Capital District. Right now we are grand central for, for all of these diseases. Um, anaplasmosis and babesiosis, I just keep hearing more and more uh, people that have, have gotten them. Uh, and there is another one, uh, Powassan virus, which is a virus, so there is no treatment for it. Luckily, it is, it is incredibly rare. There's been 29 cases of Powassan virus in New York ever, but we are finding more of it, more, more and more of it in the tick population. So we're going to start seeing increases in the rate of this and it is, um, can be fatal 11% of the time. So this is a really our first fatal 
tick-borne disease. So even though it's rare, we're very concerned about it. And the other thing about the Powassan virus is that it can be transmitted 15 minutes after attachment. So that idea that we have time after tick bites us that 24, 48 hours, we're just gonna take that off the table because here's a potentially fatal disease that can get transmitted almost immediately upon a attachment. So we do not want to get bit by a tick, period. And then another chart from the CDC, this is the timing of Lyme disease. Most people, again, they think of ticks as being a summer issue, but most people are gonna get Lyme disease. It's good, they're gonna be diagnosed in June and July from the tick that bit them in May and June. So as we come into the springtime, this is when we really need to be taking our greatest precautions. And I grabbed some information from uh, the New York State Department of Health that has been doing tick collections since 2008 across the state. And I just picked Seneca County as kind of central to the Finger Lakes area um, and, and looked at the comparisons of the ticks and those that had these different disease pathogens in them. So Lyme, almost half of the ticks out there for the adults are carrying it some years up to 62%. Anaplasmosis, some years was almost 9%. Uh, Babesiosis is still pretty rare in the Finger Lakes, but it's gonna be increasing. And Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a tick relapsing fever, it's very similar to Lyme disease. What's interesting about Borrelia miyamotoi is that it can be transmitted, um, or I'm sorry, it can be transferred from an infected female to the eggs. So those teeny tiny six-legged larvae can be transmitting Borrelia pneumotoi. So that's the problem. So how are we feeling? <laughs> um, no, sorry. People at the point that they just don't want to go outside anymore. <laughs> yeah, Debbie, I get it. I do. I call this the point that I want you to be at as healthy paranoia, because this is a real risk. These are life changing illnesses. But I want you to be healthy about it because not going outside is not healthy. Um, there are health consequences to that. So um, I want you to be have this in the back of your mind, but now we're going to get into what can we do to protect ourselves. And for this, I want to introduce something that I discovered in the pandemic because um, somebody was using this as a model, the Swiss cheese model of personal protection. So you've heard a lot of different things that you can do to protect yourself from ticks and we're gonna go through those none of them are gonna protect you 100% of the time. But the more of those strategies that you put into place, the more protected you are going to be from getting that tick bite in the first place. So first one, they make me say this, <laughs> avoid tick areas. So we talked about tick habitats. Um, tall grass is where we might find the dog ticks, wooded areas are where we're gonna find the, the black-legged ticks, those moist areas. But these are the places that are great to be in. So yes, are there steps that we can do to reduce our risk when we go outside? Yes, there are. So we can pick our trails. And if it's springtime, we might want to stick to trails that look more like the ones on the um, left-hand side. There are wider trails. There's no vegetation within them. We're not brushing up against vegetation. It's much less likely that we're going to brush up against a questing tick in those situations than if we were looking at uh, areas that are the paths on, on the right-hand side. And especially during the first year of the pandemic, when we were out there and people it was pretty much locked down. I found that the trails got much wider and I spent a lot of time off the trail because we were all like avoiding each other like the plague. Uh, so trying to stay out of the vegetation is good for the trail, but it's also uh, going to be good for protecting yourself against ticks. But the trail on the far right 
that is the trail that takes me to my favorite trout hole. So I'm not going to give up doing what I love to do because I want to avoid questing ticks. So there are other steps that we can take uh, besides just avoiding habitat. And this is a slide in the springtime. I love taking pictures of spring ephemerals um, and the wildlife that's out there. So here I am in the spring, top tick risk time, lying on my belly uh, in these woods. Since I learned all this and I've been taking, taking all of these uh, steps into account, I have not gotten a tick bite doing this activity. So what am I doing? Well, one thing that I'm doing is I'm dressing to exclude. So this is uh, choosing what I'm going to wear when I'm going outdoors. And because black-legged ticks are most active in the springtime and in the fall, it's usually okay to wear long pants because uh, it's a little bit cooler out there. I'm, I know I'm not going to... Uh, get heat stroke because it's not going to be in the 90s. I, I'm also in shady areas. So I'm going to be wearing long pants and I'm going to seal that up so that the ticks can't get underneath the pants. So if I tuck my pants into my socks, if the ticks are going to get on me around ankle length and they start crawling up, well, they're not going underneath the pants. If they got underneath, they're aiming for the dark, moist areas. So kind of use your imagination. We don't want ticks there. So you want to keep them on the outside. And if they get up to my waist, then I'm going to, they're going to, if my shirt's tucked in, then they have to keep going. If I'm wearing light colored clothing and I just kind of check myself every once in a while, you're going to see um, if there are any ticks that are crawling up, even that poppy seed sized one. So this next picture is a video that I took of a black legged tick nymph on fabric and it's not a fast mover. It's kind of just wandering up there. Um, so it's not like it's going to get on your ankle and then reach your armpit in, in a couple of minutes. It's gonna take a while, um, but it's also moving uh, enough so that you might not pick out the poppy seed size nymph, but you might catch that movement as long as you're aware of it. So um, dressing to exclude and, and checking yourself while you're out there and also checking the people that you're with. All right, repellents. These are the things that we're going to put onto our skin. What they do is they confuse the sense organs of the, of the tick. So that's going to include things like DEET, picaridin, IR3535, and oil of lemon eucalyptus. These are the only four ingredients that have been shown to work against ticks themselves. And each of them, uh, they're pesticides. You need to read the uh, instructions within the tick removal kit. If you get that, there is a magnifying lens. Make sure you bring it with you to the store because you're going to need the magnifying lens to be able to read the instructions on the bottle. And again, the purpose of these, what they do is they actually interfere with the sense organs so they don't see you as a host. Uh, they come in different percentages. Um, the stronger or the greater the percentage, the longer it's supposed to last, although we, we don't see any real benefits going above 35%. So typically, if you're going to go with feed or precarion, to, to go with more of a 20% level so you're not exposing yourself to a really concentrated level of that uh, chemical and making sure that you are uh, applying it according to label. So all of them are gonna tell you, do not apply to skin that you're going to then cover with clothing. There's a reason for that. They did the safety uh, testing. Oil and eucalyptus sounds more natural to people so they want to go with that. Uh, and it does work but it has a much shorter period of time where it's effective. So if you are the kind of person that is okay reapplying every hour, then that might be the product for you. But if you know you're not going to do that, then I would choose to, to go with a different product if you were going to go with a repellent. And don't forget your pets. Um, there's lots of different products out there. We recommend that you talk to your veterinarian because they are going to be the ones that know your pet the best and will be able to make the best recommendations for your particular situation. 
The picture on the right hand side is a picture of a uh, tick nymph that I found a couple of years ago. It was the first nymph I found of the season. I found it in my bed because my pet had had jumped on my bed and this tick was dead because of the treatment that I had put on my pet. Um, but if this is a real issue, keeping pets out of the bedroom is also going to help to protect you uh, because it's not the ticks are not only a risk to them, but it's a risk to you if the pets bring them in and then expose you uh, to the ticks. All right, ticks are small. We've already kind of covered this. Uh, we talked about exclusion. This is not going to work if you're wearing um, cheap socks because those tiny nymphs can, can actually get through. Them. So we can treat the, the clothing themselves uh, with a chemical called permethrin. And there's two ways that you can do this. You can buy it off the shelf as do it yourself. It's a 5% solution. And there is a chemical that is in there that is going to make the permethrin bind to the cloth. So once um, it's dry, it's bound to the cloth. It's going to last, according to the label, um, most of them are going to last six weeks or six washes, whichever comes first. There is a product out there that only lasts for two weeks. I wouldn't do that because then you have to reapply it more often. Um, get the one that's going to last longer. It's bound to the cloth. It's not absorbed into the skin. Um, you can wash the clothes. It's still bound to it. Uh, the one thing you need to be careful with this is when it's in that concentrated form, when you are first applying it, it is toxic to cats. So you want to keep the cats away while you are treating the clothing and before it dries. But after that initial application, even after you've washed it, it's no longer dangerous. Um, this is my method of choice because it's a set it and forget it method. And um, my cat is on my lap all the time um, when I'm wearing my Prometheum treated clothing to no effect. My cat is almost 19. This is the <laughs> confirmation of that. Um, you can also buy pre-treated clothing. And this clothing is supposed to last um, for the lifetime of the garment or up to 70 washes. You can buy pre-treated clothing or you can um, take your clothing, take your favorite hiking outfits and send them off to a company uh, and it'll come back professionally treated. The downside to doing it this way is a higher concentration. So according to the label, they are telling you to wash these clothes separately than you would your normal laundry. I'm too lazy to do that. So this is not, um, you're going to want to um, go with the do-it-yourself, which is a lower concentration, and you can treat them with your regular clothes. So Wendy points out that it is toxic to honeybees. Yes, yeah, so this is going to be toxic to insects and arachnids, um, the ones that are going to land on your clothing. Or, or if you're applying it yourself, you're going to want to put it on the um, like put it onto a, a gravel or a concrete driveway on a non-windy day so you're not getting any drift and all of the chemical that you're spraying is going to land on the clothes themselves. Um, you do not have to be concerned about dogs and permethrin. Actually, a lot of the dog applications do have permethrin in it. Uh, the only time that they tell you not to apply permethrin to dogs is if you have cats in the house because those products are meant to stay wet because they're dispersed in, in the skin oils. So um, it doesn't bind, it doesn't dry. Uh, those formulations are gonna stay toxic to cats. So um, permethrin treated um, dogs are good if you only have dogs. Research has shown that permethrin is the best way to protect yourself from uh, ticks, but again, it's not Perfect. So here's a comparison of uh, untreated clothing where they took graduate students and they put ticks on them and they, you know, went back after a few hours to see which one of them were still hanging on. Uh, doesn't that make you want to sign up to be a graduate student <laughs> compared to um, people that are wearing uh, the treated t-shirts, shorts, socks, and sneakers. Um, so you can see that where they attach were places where the clothing wasn't touching. So if they were wearing long sleeve permethrin treated clothing, this would be much more effective than wearing more summer-like clothing, but still better than doing nothing. 
And again, just a recommendation or um, yes, follow the label uh, anytime you're using any of these different chemicals. And they will tell you to, to wear personal protective equipment. You're going to be very careful. You're not drenching it. You're just spraying it on so that the clothing changes color, wait for it to dry, and, and then it's safe to wear. Do not put on your clothes and say, oh, I'm going out. I need to uh, put permethrin on it and, and spray yourself. That is not according to the label, um, and that could uh, pose a risk to you. All right. No matter what kind of clothes you are wearing, you're going to want to um, put your clothes in the dryer. Chicks have been known to survive the wash cycle, even if it goes into the dryer, because there's enough moisture in there for them to stay alive. If you put the clothes directly into the dryer, into the point that it gets to 122 degrees, it's going to kill any ticks that are on there. And while your clothes are in the dryer, you're naked. So now is the perfect time to do your tick check. Uh, and the best place to do this is in the shower, because not only if any ticks fall off you, they're going to be in that hopefully white or usually light colored porcelain area. Um, so you'll be able to see them, uh, but you can also get your hands nice and soapy and kind of feel along your body to see if you feel anything that wasn't there before. Uh, that's just easier to do if your hands are nice and slippery with the soap. So you're going to search for the ticks with your eyes as well as your fingers. And you're gonna concentrate more on um, those dark moist places. So between your toes, behind the knees, the groin area under your arms. Women, we kind of wanna check underneath the breasts, along the hairline. Once you do this uh, and you make this part of your daily habit, it takes just minutes to accomplish. Uh, you're going to know every freckle. You're going to know every skin tag on your body. So this is also really good for um, checking yourself for, for uh, skin cancer. So, you know, multiple uh, benefits of doing this daily tick check and just build it into your routine. Every day, you brush your teeth, you're going to floss, you're going to do your tick check. Just make it part of uh, your your day-to-day -day existence. And you want to do this every day, even if you haven't been outside because they're gonna hang out with you for a few days and they're getting bigger, which makes them easier to find in case you miss them um, on, on the day that they actually attached. It is better for you to find a tick on day four and know that you had a tick and be able to provide that information to your physician than never finding that tick at all. So if you put in these strategies or you only use one or two when you do get a tick attached. Now, how are we going to remove it? What we don't want to do is we don't want to upset the tick. An upset tick is a salivating tick. And in the tick saliva, there's all of those chemicals and the pathogens that can come along with it. So if you think you wouldn't want to be squeezed uh, by the body, then don't do it to a tick. Um, burning it, suffocating it, putting soap and then twirling it around. That's a very common thing that I see show up on social media. Those, all going, those are all going to stress out the trick, causing it to salivate. So the recommendation that we have is to use pointy tweezers. And you will get um, a set of these in your tick removal kit. So let's see. There it is. So basically, when you're removing the tick, you want to focus on the skin itself, right where that mouth part meets the skin. You're going to pull straight up, and your skin's going to bubble up because it's really glued in there, but it's going to release. And that's the least stressful way to remove the tick. Now, with this tool, you have the tick. With a lot of the other ones that look like pry bars, there's nothing hanging onto the tick, so there's the risk of dropping it. So I re if you're going to use that tool, I recommend doing it again in the shower where if it drops off, it'll be easy to find. Um, you can take that tick and you're gonna put it into a plastic bag or into a little um, vial with alcohol in it, write the date on it, write the um, part of the body that it came on and just hang on to it. Uh, and if you start to feel badly, then you can call your physician. You can let them know that you were a bit um, by a tick uh, and, and ask them what their strategy is. 
I am running out of time, but I'm quickly going to show you this video of me removing a nymph, focusing on the skin and pulling straight up. And then you also, it's a good idea to get that tick identified. And um, most cooperative extension offices uh, will do this for you. Uh, within the tick removal kit is an identification card. Uh, we look at um, that shield behind the head called the sputum. They're all different patterns on the different ticks. And we look at the mouth parts for identification. If you can do this yourself, fantastic. If not, there's other resources that are out there. And the reason that you want to identify the tick is because the different ticks carry different diseases and you want to be able to tell your physician what you might have been exposed to. There is an app. Um, this is a project where they are collecting data about how people are protecting themselves from ticks. It is a uh, citizen science project and I would encourage you to download that app. Uh, it's going to send you reminders to do your daily tick check. Um, is it time to put permethrin on your clothing? Uh, that kind of recommendation. If you do get a tick on you, you can send them a picture and they will let you know um, what the what type of ticket is too. So there's an identification service that's uh, involved with that. So stop disease, think Swiss cheese. There are different things that you can do to protect yourself. The more of these things that you put into place, the more protected you are gonna be from uh, tick bites and these tick-borne diseases. So the punchline is, you really, really, really do not want to be bitten by a tick, but you can protect yourself by putting those strategies into place. So please, please, please go outside, enjoy the trails, enjoy your garden, enjoy the fishing, whatever makes you happy out there, go out and, and do it, but make sure you put as many strategies to protect yourself from tick bites in place as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to do a couple quick things, and then we do have a few questions in chat. But I'm going to um, quickly post the URL again for the survey. And for anybody who came in late or missed this, if you go and complete this survey, um, and then you'll get a confirmation via email. Forward that confirmation to me, and I'm putting my email in here too. Um, and you all should have it, so you got an email from me with the link to this. That works. Uh, forward the confirmation email to me and we'll get one of those tick kits sent to you. It might take a little bit of time because we just kind of worked this out tonight. Normally, um, when Joelle gives these presentations in person, she hands these out, um, but we're not in person. But I was like, oh, I want to figure out a way we can give to people. So we this is the, the method we came up with, but now I have to get the tick kits from Joelle and we are <laughs> close. And then I will have to get them in the mail to you. So give me a little time, but we'll work on it. Um, and we did have a few questions in here. Uh, we had some comments about the, a tick spoon. I don't know, Joel, if you need to have want to comment on that or if that's just like a so, so the tick spoon, uh, I mentioned the, um, the ones that look like a pry bar. Basically, the way that works is there's a V-shape. And the idea is that you're going to get that right where the mouth part meets the skin. And you're going to pull that out. And they can be effective if used correctly especially on the adults. It's really hard to make sure that you've got underneath the body of that poppy seed size nymph because of their small size. So if you don't, and uh, I, I once had somebody who's just like, oh yeah, I have the pry, the pry bar and I'm like going after the tick like this. And that's a good way to stress that tick out and get it to salivate. So you have to be very cautious with it but it can be an effective tool, more effective on adults than it is on the uh, than it is on the, the poppy seed size nymphs. And it does have the benefit that it does collect within that spoon, which you don't have with other tick tools. Um, somebody asked if tea tree shampoo helped, like in the aftercare portion of this. So there has been um, no evidence of, of that working. There actually is a uh, product that will hopefully be coming out soon um, called Nucatone, which is a chemical, it's not tea tree oil, but it's kind of a, a strongly scented thing. I think it comes from grapefruits, 
um, that is supposed to kill the ticks that are attached uh, and is going to be given out as, as a soap. But how is that going to work for something like the Powassan virus, which is already, um, by the time that you get home and you get in the shower, has already trans been transmitted by that point. Which is also something that we need to um, consider when they come up with the uh, Lyme vaccine. I will, I will be the first in line to get the Lyme vaccine when it finally comes out. Um, but that's going to do nothing to protect me from anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and all the other diseases uh, that I that I was talking about. So not getting bit by a tick is still going to be really, really important, even when these other strategies come out. Um, there's another question about, it seems like there are certain areas uh, in Tompkins County, seems like certain areas like Tompkins County have more ticks than others. Is this true? It could be. Like are there areas that are hot? There's, definitely, there's definitely habitat. So they might be areas that have more invasive species. They might have more deer. Um, they might be the areas where you're not seeing them could be drier. It's it's very site specific, okay. which makes doing tick research kind of difficult. Um, and there was a question: Why the metamorphosis from just dog ticks 50 years ago to all these other types now? So there are a lot of reasons. Um, so some of it is that we have a lot more deer than we did 50 years ago. Uh, we also have climate change. So that's why we have Lone Star ticks. That's why we're getting the Gulf Coast tick. Um, the Asian Longhorn tick doesn't have anything to do with climate change. Um, that has more to do with um, invasive species being brought in, in in different ways into our country and, and yet one more issue that we're gonna have to be dealing with. So changes in our landscape. Um, I got my degree in natural resources from Cornell University and we were on top of the hill and we were looking out and the professor was saying, you are looking at 80% more forest than was here 50 years ago. So that forest is also better habitat than um, for the black legged tick than it is for the dog tick. So the dog ticks haven't gone away, but we've created the conditions for the black legged tick to really thrive throughout New York. So somebody made a comment, and I know that you are not, you are not a, a healthcare professional. So they made a comment that you can't always rely on your doctor to know about uh, Lyme disease or other tick-borne illnesses, or to be fully informed about ticks. And I think that that's absolutely accurate, and everybody needs to do their own research and advocate for themselves. But I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Joa. Basically, you're right. I, I'm not a health professional, and I try very hard not to uh, get medical advice, I will agree with you, which is why um, a lot of our information, we do point people to uh, medical information, uh, mostly from uh, the Center for Disease Control. They will describe the diseases. They will describe the symptoms of them. Um, also on our Don't Get Ticked New York um, page, there's a, you can print out an eight and a half by 11 sheet that has the different ticks and the different diseases that they carry. And when I've trained master gardeners to do identification, I encourage them to give that um, poster out with the tick that was found in the life stage. And people have brought that to their doctor and doctors have loved that because they don't know. It was hard enough to get doctors to recognize Lyme disease. The awareness that there are all of these other things that they also need to check for is, is really lacking. And, and that is something that a lot of professionals um, are working on to work with the medical establishment and, and get them on, up to speed on all of these tick-borne diseases. But most of the focus um, up until the last 10 years has been on mosquito-borne diseases. Tick work has a lot of catching up to do. I think I caught all the questions when I'm scrolling through. And you, if you feel anyone left can feel free to unmute if you have questions that I perhaps have missed or you didn't type into the chat. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up here in a few minutes. Oh, people are filling out the survey but not getting a code. Check. Um, 
um, spam folder. It should, it's set to send you an email. And I am going to warn you, um, I have clearly lost my mind and I am now a graduate student. So um, my, my project for this semester is actually going to be evaluating our Don't Get Ticked New York campaign. So I am going to be sending a follow-up survey to everybody that completes this uh, tick kit survey. So you're gonna be getting one pretty quickly. Um, so I suspect that between now and when I send out that survey, which will, well, no, because I won't send that out until April. By that point, um, there's a high likelihood that, that the ticks will be out there and active. So please, please fill out that follow-up survey, help out a graduate student. <laughs> And we just got a question that makes me laugh. The answers to that are going to help us to strengthen our campaign. Oh, we got, we got a question that, that I like because I love stickers. Somebody asked <laughs> stickers. So are there don't get ticked New York, like the logo stickers? <laughs> so we don't have logo stickers. We do have tattoos. Oh, hey. <laughs> and, and something that we came out with right before the pandemic and we stopped seeing people in person are actually cling stickers. Um, one that you can uh, put on your car window, reminding you to do a tick check, uh, which we discovered very quickly doesn't actually stick to the car window, which is frustrating at all. And we have another one that goes on the bathroom mirror. Uh, <laughs> that does work. <laughs> so just a little nudge to remind you to do that of every day. So I'm going to write down that when we send you the kits, we're also gonna make sure that you get those cling stickers. Thank you. So, so those can be included in the envelope. All right, well, I think that about wraps it up and we are at just about 8.15. I wanna thank everybody for coming um, and remind those of you who are still here that um, we welcome uh, your donations and support of the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Um, these Presentations like this are made possible because of donations and uh, member dues. So um, again, visit our website, become a member if you're not one already. And if you are, I wanna thank you because you help us uh, do this kind of stuff, which is, is excellent and educational and we really appreciate you. And thank you, Joelle, you are amazing. And thank you for doing this again for us. And I have already seen a lot of positive comments. I heard nothing but positive after the last one. So thank you so much. I will talk about ticks any day. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And then I'm going to stop recording and we'll say good night to everybody. Thank you. So if you didn't get a screenshot, just email Christy um, and we'll figure it out. <laughs>